This is the Hidden Killers podcast with Tony Bruschi. All this week, I am talking with Dr. Catherine Ramsland. Dr. Catherine Ramsland, as you may know if you're a follower of true crime, wrote the book on Dennis Rader, the BTK killer, his autobiography, in fact. She spent many years communicating back and forth with Dennis, gaining an insight unlike anyone else into the mind of one of the most notorious serial killers alive today. This week, we're going in to her mind to learn about the experiences that she had while working with Dennis Rader at that time and all the way up to today, trying to better understand the mind of a killer. Join me all this week for parts one through five of my conversation with Dr. Catherine Ramsland right here on the podcast. Were you surprised by the codes, by the challenge that he put up right away? Is that something that you were expecting or not expecting in Dennis at that time? Well, I kind of was expecting it because the, the person he had worked with before kind of prepared me for, you know, that I'll have a code name. She has a code name. <laughs> sure, sure. Anyone he talks to. So there's this filter you have to go through and it was fine. Didn't didn't really surprise me. It was just like, it's different. Yeah. And I wanted to see what that was about. How did you go into the conversation? Obviously, there's a lot of information, a lot of different areas to explore with someone like him. Where did you begin to kind of take that journey of hearing things from his own mind, from his own perspective? Well, he has, when I believe he has hypergraphia, which is a excessive writing. Okay. <laughs> so, so that was a good thing. It bad thing because it's a good thing because he would fill pages and pages of details up the page down the page you know every which way but at the same time he didn't have very good handwriting so it was time consuming but just the fact that I would have these written documents was was good because then I could use those as springboards for questions back to him seeing him you know in the prison it couldn't be in the same room with him because he's in a maximum security prison that was through monitors and stuff but just that i would come mattered to him we probably talked more on the phone than really any other medium because it first of all it was easier to do it it made him it put him at ease to be able to just talk about tv shows we were watching and those shows actually became metaphors for being able to communicate because we watched things like the walking dead and bates motel and the Amer the americans <laughs> breaking bad yeah, so yeah. so these are all really great for talking about his stuff but through this kind of coded medium that he wanted so that the guards wouldn't understand what we were trying to talk about and I don't know, it just, it fell into sort of a natural rhythm. It wasn't really hard to talk to him. He's very easy. He was respectful, which I can't say for other serial killers. Sure. I, I mean, I've talked to others who have been respectful, but I also know about some who violate. If you set parameters, you know, don't call me after nine, they'll call you at midnight. Yeah. They'll demand money. They'll maybe be vulgar. They'll ask for things. So Raider was not like that. He was respectful. He appreciated what I was trying to do. He read some difficult things. I sent a couple of books that I wanted him to read and think about and comment on regarding his own case. And he made his way through them. So he worked hard at it. And I think, I don't know, I just think I was probably fortunate to work with someone who is willing to. Certainly he's a spin doctor, sure. like like many psychopathic types of people are, he wanted me to think certain things of him, and I know I didn't see everything. He might show somebody else, for example, but I heard enough about him through other people to get, I think, a pretty full picture of who he was. What were some of the writings that you sent him that he had some difficulty working through but ultimately did? How did those things affect him and how did those conversations go? Probably the first, the, maybe the hardest one, and so they could, they didn't all get through, by the way. The sure. prison did stop some, even though they were academic books. He read Adrian Raines' 
think it was the anatomy of violence. I think that's the name of it. Okay. Adrian Rain is a one of the predominant psycho- forensic psychologists researching violence, and in particular through brain scans. So that book was about a lot of the neuropsychology and neuropsychiatry that's been done over the past you know, couple of decades. And Rain was one of the earliest people to actually study this and studied violent kinds of factors in childhood. So I wanted Rader to read some of this. And one of the things that really struck him, Adrian Rain talks a lot about a serial killer named Randy Kraft. And Randy Kraft and Dennis Rader, have a lot of things in common. So, you know, any narrator's narcissistic. So anything that he's he reads that's going to stand out to him as something he wants to talk about is going to be about him in sure. some way. So he would skip things that were like, who cares? Um, but those things that really struck him as relevant to his own situation, then he would read that but it took him probably two years to read that book but he and he made his way through it i think i sent him a few magazine articles or academic articles it was hard to get books through that was harder but if i didn't get the books through i could talk to him about some of it and he actually watched the entire series on the brain that was on pbs Mm -hmm. at the time and interesting because one was on the violent brain and so he wanted to discuss the implications for him did he might he have had brain damage because he was dropped on his head he had a brain he had a head injury when he's a teenager so he wanted to he wished he could get a, a, like some kind of mri scan something like that but you know he just tried to find his way through these things i gave him a few psychiatric assessment tests like fantasy prone personality was one because I thought he was one and turned out he had came up with a very high score. So, you know, those, you yeah. can't rely on self-assessment <laughs> you know, sure. when you're trying to do this with somebody who's incarcerated and you're not in a testing room, you have to kind of give it to them and see what they do with it. So it's not really particularly accurate or something you would put into a database, but it's still what was a good foundation for being able to ask him questions. Is Dennis curious about why he is the way he is himself, the way that he so nonchalantly delivered the statement in his sentencing hearing about everything that happened and the way that we've heard him speak in the past, very matter of fact, without a lot of emotion. Well, have, Does he wonder about why he's that You way? have to think, you have to remember the context of that. Yeah. What you saw recorded when he was at that hearing, he was completely blindsided. He thought he was just going in to plead guilty and go back to jail. Okay. It turned out the judge wanted to walk him through everything. And so he's okay. Yeah. I'll answer these, but that was not representative of the way he speaks no. to me. Okay, interesting. Which is not to say that he's sorry, because I'm not going to say that. Sure. But certainly that court appearance is not reflective of who he is. Now, he is interested in knowing why he turned out to be this way, especially because he, you know, a lot was at stake. He lost his family. He lost his social standing. He lost you know, a lot of stuff. And he was 59 when he was arrested. So he had a you know, pretty full life up to that point. Sure. And everything was completely significantly changed. So yeah, he's very interested in knowing if there's a way for him to understand that. Does he experience remorse? I would say not very deeply, especially not about the victims or their families. Although when he, we did a four-part uh, A&E documentary on the book and it made him cry when he watched the other people talking on it. So so that's interesting. Interesting. That yeah. surprised me. <laughs> yeah, because my question would be, he doesn't show remorse. Is he an individual you believe that is capable of showing remorse? Because I believe some people just, they're not. It's just, it's not an emotion that they're able to feel or generate. But then we do see, like you just said, he if he shed tears after that documentary, that's an interesting, that's an interesting fact. 
Yeah. And some people would say, well, he's just crying for himself. Maybe. Maybe. Yeah, I don't know. I'm not inside his head. I can't say that he has how deep his feelings go. I can't say that about anybody I know, sure. frankly. So he, the points at which he became emotional were points at which people were talking about the impact, the horrible impact on their life of losing their loved ones. So is that remorse? Maybe. Is he regretful? Absolutely. Does he have remorse about hurting his family? Yes, he does. How interesting. And it makes you wonder, is he relating to those moments when people are talking about that because of his own loss of his own family? Is it reminding him of that? Or is he feeling it for what happened to the other people? That's kind of the question. Is it more of a narcissistic, uh, you know, I'm feeling this and because I'm thinking about my own situation, not necessarily what I did to others. It, you know, it's not possible to know that in part because, you know, the, some of the brain work, the brain scans mm -hmm. that we are doing show differences in, first of all, the psychopathic brain. Secondly, the violent brain. So put violence and psychopathy together. In fact, most psychopaths are not violent or criminals. Those that are, you know, raider might qualify, in which case it does look as if their emotionality is fairly superficial. They know the words, not the music. As Robert Hare would say, he's the person who made the psychopathy checklist, which is a diagnostic instrument. So that's the sense of it. But you know what? I'm not in their head. I don't know how deep it goes. And I don't think anybody knows. There's more to come in my conversation with Dr. Catherine Ramsland about the BTK killer, Dennis Rader. Press subscribe so you don't miss any of our five-part series here on the podcast. I'm Tony Bruschi. Stay with us. This is the Hidden Killers Podcast. Want more? Start binging on all of our true crime podcasts right now through Apple Podcasts and get an ad-free experience when you sign up to be a True Crime Today Premium Plus member exclusively on Apple Podcasts. More of the Hidden Killers Podcast dropping soon. Press subscribe now.